Hello, and welcome back to the ninth instalment of my Failed Franchises series. In this series, I look at failed rail franchises, whether this be their contract being stripped from them, or their franchise simply being deemed poor by the public and industry. In today's video, I'll look at the first instalment of a five-part mini-series regarding the Anglian franchises. However, only four of these five can be deemed as failed. Today's franchise is the Great Eastern franchise, operated by First Great Eastern. Although short-lasting, First Great Eastern could well be classed as a failure by the public and industry for several reasons, but can they truly be classed as a failed franchise? Find out in today's video. Firstly, we need to look at how the Anglian rail system worked upon privatisation. Unlike today, where all services along the Great Eastern Mainline and West Anglia Mainline are operated under a single franchise, Upon privatisation in 1997, the region was split between three different franchises, the Anglian franchise, the West Anglia Great Northern franchise, and the Great Eastern franchise. Today we'll look at arguably the smallest franchise out of the three, First Great Eastern, and how their tenure as a franchise was so short-lived, most people wouldn't even remember them as an operator. First Group was awarded the Great Eastern Railways franchise on the 4th of December 1996, with the franchise running for seven and a quarter years until mid-2003, later extended to mid-2004. The group, operated by First, inherited the Great Eastern Mainline as far as Ipswich, operating at all stations between Liverpool Street and the Suffolk County Town, from the 5th of January 1997. First Great Eastern also operated branches towards Southend, Southminster, Braintree, Colchester, Clacton, Walton on the Nays, and Harwich. The operator also took over operations of the Romford to Upminster branch line and the Gainsborough line from Marks Tay to Sudbury. Overall, First Great Eastern called it just 61 stations, making it one of the smallest train operating companies at the time for stations served. However, it did have quite a substantial fleet size of over 140 trains at its peak. First Great Eastern inherited three Class 121 bubble car units hired from Silverlink and later some Class 150s and Class 153s hired from neighbouring Anglia Railways. Although these were DMUs, the remainder of the First Great Eastern Fleet consisted of EMUs, with the other lines being electrified. The company had 43 Class 315s for commuter services out of London Liverpool Street towards Shenfield and Southminster, as well as one unit for use on the Romford to Upminster branch line. At the time, the 315s were only around 15 years old even younger, and making up the bulk of the First Great Eastern Fleet with the Class 321s. These 100 mile an hour regional units operated much of the long distance services from London to Braintree, Southend, Ipswich, Walton on the Nays, Colchester and Clacton, with the units also seen on the Wickford to Southminster branch too. First Great Eastern's oldest electric units were the Mark II Slam Door Class 312s, built in the mid 1970s. They operated services between Colchester and Walton on the Nays, Harwich and Manningtree as well as peak services out of London towards Clacton and Ipswich. The 312s, being slam door units, were a priority for replacement under the franchise commitments. Hence in March 1998 it was announced that £35 million had been allocated for the 96 slam door 312 vehicles to be replaced by modern electric units by at least 2003. As well as this, the franchise required the ageing Class 121s to be replaced, hence the introduction of Class 150s and 153s from Anglia Railways from October 1998. First Great Eastern also introduced bus rail through ticketing to allow for journeys to stretch to towns and villages which did not have rail connections, but had bus connections via First. Also, First Great Eastern were one of the first franchises to allow internet ticket purchases, along with the other two First franchises. The company also spent £50,000 on new bike facilities at stations in 1999. In 2000, it was announced that the new units would be Class 360s, built by Siemens as part of their DeZero family. First Great Eastern had ordered 21 four-car units, which would be constructed in Germany. The units would be a huge upgrade to the Class 312s. They would feature air conditioning, automated plug doors, CCTV, wheelchair areas, first-class sections, and much greater acceleration for reduced journey times. The 360s would be the first units to receive the first Barbie branding, with the rest of the fleet painted in a green, blue and grey livery. These upgrades were partly funded by large profits recorded by First, recording around £55 million profit in 2000 to 2001, despite several rail crashes leading to passenger decreases. However, by summer 2001, it was clear that passenger numbers had not been restored to normal, but had in fact increased substantially. 
compared to 1996 commuter figures, the amount of passengers into London had increased by 20% thanks to more competitive fare prices against cars. However, there was now a serious overcrowding issue on many commuter operators in London, including First Great Eastern. The Strategic Rail Authority, SRA, Chief Executive Mike Grant, said that there was an urgent need for extra capacity, with the SRA working with First Great Eastern to find a solution. First Great Eastern had services that were over 4.5% over capacity in the peaks, with services strengthened by using extra Class 3 trials in the peak as trial carriages, something the Class 321s could not achieve. Their maximum was 8 coaches. Even with this, the service was not at all ideal, with a First Great Eastern customer service advisor telling a passenger that the service currently is absolute utter rubbish. Old unrefurbished stock with delays, cancellations and overcrowding had led to a poor image for First Great Eastern. A spokesperson for the company responded to the claims, acknowledging the poor performance and suggesting the delays weren't the company's fault. Also around 2000, the SRA announced potential plans for a single East Anglian franchise. Rail news site, Rail Future, were not so keen on the proposals. They believed that a potential cross-rail service would not fit with a joint franchise. As well as this, they believed the operator would ignore rural routes, focusing on the intercity London services and the commuter belt. They also suggested that the current franchise setup works well, and suggested having two operators running the route could be better. By 2002, the first Class 360s for First Great Eastern had been constructed and were undergoing testing, which would lead to another boost in capacity soon. It was also confirmed that a few Class 312s would remain with First Great Eastern even after the 360s entered service. This would allow for extra capacity at peak times in response to the SRA capacity report. As well as this, First Great Eastern introduced £5 summer ticket offers, where anyone who purchased a June 2002 Modern Railways magazine would get access to a leaflet which enabled adults to purchase an all-lines First Great Eastern Rover ticket for just £5 and £1 for a child. The only downside was that the Rover ticket could only be used on a First Great Eastern services and only on a Sunday in July. Nevertheless, it was a good encouragement to bring leisure passengers onto First Great Eastern, with First Great Eastern then running a £10 ticket promotion in August, open to any passenger. Also in summer 2002, First Great Eastern began playing classical music at some of its stations due to an increase in youth vandalism. Ironically at Frinton, youths eventually found the speaker wires and cut them. Nevertheless, a First Great Eastern spokesperson said the pilot was very successful, with youths no longer vandalising stations. In June 2002, First Great Eastern provided extra services in the last ever Benson and Hedges Cricket Cup final, where Essex played Warwickshire at Lords in London. First Great Eastern confirmed that extra services would be provided, and all services would be strengthened to at least eight carriages for the Saturday match. This was received well by Essex fans, with the event being hailed a success and little overcrowding reported. However, in the winter of 2002 and early 2003, First Great Eastern were not praised at all. Instead, due to the big freeze, many First Great Eastern services were cancelled, especially during January 2003. Services were hugely affected into London, with the cold conditions continuing into early February. The cold conditions were not normally seen as far south as they were in 2003, so the infrastructure and network rail operation teams were not prepared for the low temperatures, affecting most First Great Eastern services. Later in March, more disruption occurred after an arson attack rendered a Class 312 unusable. In the arson attack, occurring in Colchester sidings around midnight on the 12th of March, at least three coaches were burnt and signalling equipment was also cut through. The firefighters had to wait at least an hour before being able to attend the scene due to the power equipment still being live. The incident led to huge disruption across the Great Eastern mainline the following morning, with First Great Eastern unable to run a number of services with several units stranded in Colchester sidings until the situation was cleared up. Signalling failures also disrupted services, with many passengers forced onto already overcrowded Anglia rail services. First Great Eastern were forced to curtail all services to south of Colchester, putting more passengers on Anglia services. Work on the signalling systems was not able to begin until after the police had released the sidings back to First Great Eastern. Many passengers were critical of First Great Eastern, suggesting they never received compensation, which they had the right to. Many also criticised the company for the lack of information at smaller stations along the line, such as at Walton on the Nays, where passengers were stranded with no information regarding their service. Despite this, First Great Eastern ended the year on around 90% of services being on time within five minutes, 
despite the public perceiving First Great Eastern to be a bad operator. This high punctuality was mostly due to First Great Eastern receiving two Class 3 trails from C2C to bolster capacity after the arson. By the start of 2003, the SRA had made up their mind about merging the Anglian franchises together into the Greater Anglia franchise and had invited bidders forward. First Group, arguably the most successful applicant in the area of the merger, put forward their bid under the new Great Eastern Railway Limited franchise name. They claim that, if they won the franchise, they would provide modern coaches across the London to Norwich route, clock face services for branch lines, hourly services from Chelmsford to Norwich and across branch lines, refurbishment of their commuter stock on the Great Eastern and West Anglia routes. Great Northern will become its own franchise run by First Capital Connect. First Group also suggested that they would increase bus connections along its routes, improve interchanges at stations and lengthen platforms for more 12-car services to be able to operate. First argued that they knew the region well, with First Great Eastern being consistently listed as one of the operators of the year, and one of the best performing companies financially in the country. However, despite First Group turning a once yearly £40 million subsidy into a £10 million repayment, they weren't even included in the final free shortlist, with Arriva, GB Rail and National Express all being shortlisted. For First and many passengers, this came as a huge shock, with the group receiving lots of publicity. The SRA suggested that First were arrogant and believed that because they ran the service previously, they had the right to run it again. This was not the case, of course. They suggested that First had not acknowledged the updated franchising system, which had changed prior to the bidding process began. The SRA argued that First just did not have enough to offer compared to the three successful bidders, with the taxpayer benefiting more from the other three bidders. Although the SRA had made up their mind, the passengers had not. The Manning Tree Rail Users Association issued a press release saying that they met the news with horror and disbelief, suggesting that First Great Eastern had a relatively good operations under difficult circumstances. Rail Future East Anglia Branch Secretary Nick Dibbin also spoke out against the SRA, with many passengers worried at the possibility of the franchise being won by Arriva, with the company embroiled in strikes during 2003. First Group also complained to the SRA in April when it was confirmed that they had to follow stricter punctuality rules compared to their rivals, Anglia. Anglia had a 10 minute headway where services arriving under 10 minutes late were classified as on time, whereas First Great Eastern had just 5 minutes headway, leading to less profits for First and a worse record to display, despite overall services being more punctual. Also in April, Anglia Railways announced that they would refresh their Class 153s, with some still being on hire to First Great Eastern. The units would receive a £250,000 refresh, including new tables, wall panels, seat covers and carpets. As well as this, mechanical modifications would see a reliability improvement also. In June, first drop over the failed Anglian bid reached new levels when the company announced it would take the Strategic Rail Authority to court. Commuters supported this move, but the authority claimed it would defend any legal action robustly before the Greater Anglia franchise announcement of the winning bidder in December 2003. However, by July, all legal action was dropped when the SRA dismissed Connex's bid for the Transpennine franchise, leaving First as the only available bidder. Hence, First would still have a new franchise to run in 2004. Not that First Transpennine Express was much good. In the same month, it was announced that First Great Eastern were the most punctual operator across Anglia and the East London commuter operators, receiving 87.8% on-time rating versus 75.9% for Anglia and 80.5% for West Anglia Great Northern. Complaints were also 90% lower than Anglia per 100,000 journeys. However, passengers were overall less satisfied with First Great Eastern, achieving just 72% overall satisfaction versus 76% for Anglia. By August 2003, First Great Eastern's new Class 360s entered service, providing more capacity and a better journey for the 50,000 passengers who commuted into London each day. Also in September, First Great Eastern were praised at the National Rail Awards for having an extremely high level of punctuality, reliability and customer service, despite this being their last year as an operator. Also in September, First Great Eastern had a scare with their now 20-year-old Class 321s. Fellow 321 operator Silverlink had encountered major issues with their trains, leaving 45,000 passengers stranded across the network, although that is for a future failed franchise video. Do ensure you subscribe for that. This then prompted First Great Eastern to check all their trains for loose bolts on brake discs. However, no issues were found, 
with First Great Eastern being praised for checking the units to ensure passenger safety. In December 2003, it was confirmed that National Express had won the operations to the new Greater Anglia franchise from March 2004, taking over from First Great Eastern, Anglia and West Anglia Great Northern. The new franchise would allow for a more integrated Anglia, with more services and extra carriages provided. However, First Great Eastern still had some months remaining to operate the franchise. Sadly, these weren't amazing months. The Class 360s had encountered major technical problems, with half the fleet being withdrawn for a prolonged period of time in the beginning of 2004 due to electrical faults. This led to the Class 312s being reintroduced on off-peak services, with many services from Liverpool Street being delayed, cancelled or short-formed until the issues were resolved in February. Despite this, the Class 312s remained in service until June 2004, after the franchise handover. And speaking of franchise handovers, on the 31st of March 2004, First Great Eastern ended a short-lived seven-year operating history by handing over their portion of the new Greater Anglia franchise to National Express East Anglia, who I will cover in a future episode. Anyway, can we then class First Great Eastern as a failed franchise? Well, as a franchise, it only lasted a mere seven years, so in that respect, yes. However, as an operator, First Great Eastern were pretty decent and had a loyal customer base who even wanted them to continue running services, which says a lot. Although they were snobby and stroppy about the Greater Anglia franchise bidding failure, they run a relatively good service and were one of the earliest companies to introduce brand new units for their routes. But what do you think? Should they be classed as a failed franchise, or a franchise that was the stepping stone to providing a large integrated Anglian network like we have today? Let me know in the comments below, and do consider liking, subscribing, and checking out the whole playlist in the link in the description below. Also do consider joining my channel to support me and get some nice perks such as access to private Discord channels and access to videos early. Special thanks to my first class member, Mia Jane, and my business zone members, Anthony Harris and Smudgy Cat. Also thanks to Deva Rooney for his donations and membership. Thanks so much for watching, check out my Twitter, Discord and Instagram in the links below and I'll see you soon. Goodbye. <laughs>